Hi guys, it's me. It's Ron Funches, your friend. And I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the podcast and watching the podcast on YouTube. And for however you consume it, we've been doing more consistent and it seems like uh, people are enjoying it. Um, I got invited to a podcast that I really enjoy that I'm going to go be on and hopefully promote this podcast. So um, appreciate you guys. We're putting in hard work again. And it seems like it, it, it's, um, I don't know about paying off. Paying off would include money. But <laughs> <laughs> it is seen I'm, I'm having a good time um if you want to support the podcast you go to patreon.com slash getting better with run um you can become a patreon supporter get a shout out on the podcast that's pretty much about it if you don't want to do that that's fine i understand i make money in multiple ways and i'm trying trying to beg you for money um other than that but the way you can support me is when i come to your town Come on over, say hello, buy a ticket. Listen to me talk for an hour while you either laugh or shut the fuck up. So <laughs> if you want to come see me, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky this coming week, March 21st through the 23rd at the Louisville Comedy Club. I will be in New York, Rochester, psych, thought you got you got your New York City. You thought it was you. Uh uh-uh, uh, I'm going upstate, baby. Rochester, New York, comedy at the Carlson, March 29th and 30th. I also will be going other places that I'm looking for while I talk to you. <laughs> we got fun voices shows. Um it's our show at the Comedy Store in the Belly Room in Los Angeles. If you're in L.A., we got the next few shows coming up. We have this one to, well, no, this won't be out before then, so never mind. But <laughs> April 20th, we got a great show. Um, normally, I don't tell you the guests at all, but I believe Beth Stellan and Pink Fox will be on the show. Um, 10.30 p.m. Belly Room Comedy Store, April 20th. I mean, we are also doing our Netflix is a joke festival show at fun voices may 11th so if you're a fan of blair and i and you want to support us during this festival because not only is it a festival it is a tracking device that netflix uses to see who they think is popular enough to invest more in so if you would like to help us trick them into thinking we are that come on down to the <laughs> show uh the best one for you to be is that may 11th 10 30 p.m netflix is a joke festival um again april 20th for 420 we're have a special sponsor and be giving out some fun gifts if you know what i mean a wink wink and then also i think i'm it's not on sale currently it's going to be announced i believe march 27th is the it's going to be officially announced but as again you know on here on the podcast i don't care i let you know may 5th we're going to do my show at the netflix is a joke festival the brunches with funches noon on a sunday at the bourbon room so put that in your calendars may 5th sunday noon at the bourbon room we're gonna have some great fucking guests there as well um uh, including perhaps my buddy rick glassman perhaps my buddy rory scoville all things are subject to change but um we'll let you know and hopefully i'll see you there other than that loot season two april 3rd on apple tv you can watch rock paper scissors on nickelodeon monday through friday i believe at 5 30 and i think that's it oh and i'm an inside out two coming out in theaters june 14th i'm in a pixar movie we did it thank you god um, <laughs> other than that let's get to the podcast hi i hope you're feeling strong Malcolm Hill. I hope you're feeling brave. I hope you're feeling loved. I'm grateful for that love. I hope you're feeling appreciated as a person. And I hope you're just out there doing the things that you love and that you want to do. Make you happy knowing that this life isn't just about making money and surviving. But it's about embracing and having fun and enjoying. And I know that's hard Prices are up everywhere. Money is tight, but hopefully it's leading you to uh, a world where you can see that some things just aren't worth it. This seems like a world where it ain't worth buying no McDonald's, no Wendy's, no fast food. Unless I'm in a commercial, then we will immediately change course on that. (laughs) 
open to business. Uh, but <laughs> but prices is going up. They're doing surge pricing and dynamic pricing on stuff. You guys better off. You got to cook your own meal, stay at home with your family, and, and, and simplify. And then that can feel rough and feels tight. And I I mean, I know if I'm feeling it because I got I'm fighting a war on multiple fronts, having to pay for every other day something with the house needs fixing. Everything costs apparently five thousand uh, dollars in life that you ever need. And dealing with having to pay my lawyers, paying accountants. You know, Malcolm's wanting to go to a college program and then trying to prep for Teddy's preschool. And, you know, you feel it. And I got to take gigs and do things to keep going. And, you know, it, it was weird in the cycle of um, acting and projects is that usually at the time when people see the projects and stuff is the time where I'm not doing when i'm doing the worst financially <laughs> because you know when i'm working on the job i'm getting the check every week and then uh we wait a while then it comes out and then you got to find out if the show's coming back or not and that's where i am right now is in the spot where i have to operate in a mentally whether or not i'm going to come back for a third season of loot or a second season of rock paper scissors or find other opportunities and same time I got to keep auditioning and doing stand-up gigs on the road and going to places that um taking multiple flights and 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 changing my schedule around and making it a and it's a balance because I have to you know either I'm at home with both my sons at my youngest son Monday through Wednesday and then get on a flight Wednesday afternoon and then I'm doing stand up Thursday through Saturday and coming home Sunday and then repeating that Monday through Wednesday. And it is, it gets tiring and I'm lucky. I'm lucky and, and blessed that I have help and I have a good, my mom's around. I got a great nanny who, who helps out with things, but I also like to be an active dad and um, just be around and take my son out and do stuff. So it can be very tiring. And then also, just the stress of not knowing, you know, just wanting to maintain financially for my kids, but you gotta, uh, there's that survival and that thrive mindset. Right. And I got to tell myself because I've done it before and I have the skill set, and I deepen my skill set, and I work hard and I keep going to acting class and I take auditions, even if I know, I mean, a lot of times I take auditions because the way that I also write and I also um, have been part of projects, I look at a thing and I go, oh, I'm not right for this. <laughs> I'm not the guy. I'm probably maybe third place on this list of think people. I, I will think of people that I would cast. And um, but I still go in and take the audition. A, if it's a great audition and it's going to strengthen my my skills, the because when you get an audition, you know, for at least someone like me, it's not like I just show up and cold read or do a thing. I reach out to my coach and we prep. I prep on my own and I prep with her and then I um, work on it to where it's like my number one priority until I do the audition and then I throw it away and I don't think about it anymore. I try not to. There's definitely a couple I still think about, but if you don't hear back in a week or two, you pretty much know the gist of things. Plus there's always been the situation where sometimes I don't get the thing I auditioned for, but they find another part for me in that project. So um, if it's a person I know I want to work with or a, a project that just seems amazing, I go in and I take that audition and just hope for the best. And then in between, I'm going out to Kentucky and uh, Tacoma and all these other places that I actually, I mean, I'm, and I'm kind of framing it as if it's like um, Hollywood versus regular life type of stuff. But I love both because it's a great balance of making sure I still stay connected to real people who have real work and real struggles um, who you know, my struggles and stuff and things that I have to deal with would be stuff they they wish for, you know? 
And obviously people were right. I'm not, again, I feel like I'm framing this in a weird way, but I want people like, oh, you're doing this new, he's a regular, you know, it's not like that. It's just, we all got different jobs or different things that we do. And, but we got the same type of struggles, the same type of stress, the same type of, um, goals and things that we want to accomplish most of it just peace of mind and the ability to have fun with our family and and prosper and so i just want that for you and want that for me (laughs) i just won't be left alone to go ahead and do that uh and also just in the last couple weeks we lost a few couple people that meant a lot to me in entertainment world um of course we lost a pro wrestler virgil um mike jones who uh, i'm sorry i grew up at a different time where you have to say that after you say the words mike jones who mike jones uh but also (laughs) known as pro wrestler virgil or vincent um and someone who i got to know a little bit through comedy um we did a show together where he led me out to the ring when i got to wear the million dollar belt and uh, it was one of my funnest experiences. And so, and then just, there's people, especially if you're black and in entertainment, that are trailblazers in different ways. And they're kind of even unknown heroes. And someone like Virgil, whose main job was as a manservant for a rich white person. And his whole thing was that he eventually shucked the chains of his master and turned against him and beat him and won the million dollar title um was something that was inspiring for a kid in my age and and during that time in the early 90s and um and it is also one of those things when you really you really get to see the difference between a way that sometimes people want you present it and how you are and he was such a great athlete and a um, good looking dude that he could have been so much more than a manservant. And, but he played the part that he could at that time. So that other people like now, like, you know, people like the rock, people like um, Montez Ford, people just can be themselves and just be good wrestlers and people like Bobby Lashley and they can just be black and good wrestlers and they don't have to play part even though Bobby Lashley did play a, a black bull who was gonna cuck a white dude's lady on a thing I remember that for a while but although that was a pretty hot plot line um <laughs> although wait no is he white it was Rusev so I don't think he was he's not white um either way <laughs> and then we lost Richard Lewis, who um tremendous comedian, icon in the comedy world, uh, and just someone who I is, was inspired by from a young age. And really, I don't know if I would have been a comedian if it wasn't for someone like Richard Lewis, because when I was a kid, I my mom would let us rent a lot of different VHSs from Hollywood videos in Chicago, Illinois. And I would always either get a pro wrestling one um, that I hadn't seen before, or I would get stand up comedy or a comedy of some type. And I remember through Dave Chappelle and Robin Hood, man in tights, which is a classic, probably going to need to watch that this weekend. Um, I learned about Richard Lewis and it was this, dude who looked nothing like me and spoke nothing like me and but I could relate to his angst and his um lack of self-confidence and his just the, his view of the world like he could see more than what was on the surface level and decades later he was always still working still doing great work still being hilarious and I never got to meet him and I really wish I did. I've gotten to meet so many of my comedic heroes, but um, there are a few that, that I never did, but um, he's definitely inspired me. And I don't think I would have been a comedian if it wasn't for him. And um, again, why am I, at least I get to be do some six degrees of separation since I was in an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, where I feel like I'm at least somewhat part of the, the, the family and the thing, but you know, either way, I'm, I'm in comedy, and I just want to miss um, Richard, and if you get a chance, go back, watch some of his old specials, go back, watch Robin Hood, Man in Tights, and 
um, just see how much of a special mind and funny guy he really was. Watch, the, you know, early seasons of Curb, and you'll see some really, really great improv work from him. And it's um, just something I wanted to talk about because I feel like, you know, people just pass along and stuff. And sometimes we're very, I'm very focused on just myself on this podcast. So I just wanted to take a minute and, and just say rest in peace to both Virgil and Richard Lewis. Um, and we don't really have a check in on me court wise or anything like that. We're just in a standstill. Hopefully I'll be divorced soon. <laughs> One day, hopefully by the summer. Um, and then health wise, really working hard on that, on my Pilates, jujitsu and weightlifting combo. Been big into that. Um, and just excited, getting ready to go to a big wedding. Um, Ainsley on Lou is Stephanie Styles is getting married and excited to go celebrate that because I still big fan of love. Um, not a fan that I probably won't have a date for it because <laughs> I'm on square one when it comes to dating. Um, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I'm really enjoying myself and being with me and spending more time with my son and my mom and my sons um, had a great birthday. I guess that's something, the last thing we talk about before we go. I just want to thank all the people who reached out and wished me a happy birthday. Um, and just all my friends who made sure I had a happy birthday. I went to Seattle and saw Bob James, great concert pianist and um, jazz musician. And it was really cool, again, turning 41, which I feel like is turning one in adult years, you know. I feel like you're not an adult till you're 40. And now I'm like, oh, I'm a one-year-old adult, you know? And going to a jazz show really let me see just how much further I have to go in my life and and the path that I want to take because it was Fools in Seattle, Jazz Alley, which is a tremendous club, a legendary club. And to see so many different older, affluent people who still look good, dressed to the nines, looking stylish, looking like they already, you know, they the kids is out of the house, looking like they just enjoying life and being themselves. And I was like, man, that's where I want to go. And I feel like as we get older, sometimes we want to, I think there's a big thing culturally for us to reject age and reject wisdom and reject the experience that comes with getting older and in turn to just hold on to youth forever and stay young forever. And that's not like I'm not trying to do things. I try to work on my skin. I try to work on things just so that I can stay um, aesthetically pleasing. But at the same time, I, I, I'm i happy to get older. I'm happy to be more confident in myself and what I like and what I don't like. And to just Go to jazz clubs with old man because it's really fun. I'm at the jazz club and the guy's like 60 years old being like, oh, I smell weed around here. And I'm like, oh, I'm 40 and someone's still giving me shit for smelling like weed. This is super cool. I loved it. It made me feel like a young hooligan. And so <laughs> I really appreciate that. And my friends, we took me out mini golf in because you know I love my mini golf. Um, and just... Again, everybody that support me and, and, and really pre showed me that they cared during my birthday, the improv. Um, I really appreciate that because it means a lot to me, especially in these last couple of years where sometimes you f I felt a little alone or isolated or not um, cared for. So I just want to, you know, be honest and say I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I think it's a funny one. I think it's a good one. We learned a lot about a new friend um, who got a brand new special out. It's called Detroit Player. You can check it out on YouTube right now, but possibly after the podcast, please. Uh, <laughs> enjoy our great talk with our new, new friend, Paul Elia. I thought it was Elia at first, but it turns out, well, you'll find out. I don't want to ruin the joke. Enjoy it! All right. Oh, I'm glad that... Oh, what can I say? I usually like to start with compliments. 
Um, and I want, so there's like two different directions I want to go. Um, first I'll say, um, that I really appreciate what you and Matt and your team did during the pandemic with your show. Um, it was what, you know, at a time when not just cause you missed doing stand up or you missed the money or things like that. But like for mo- a lot of us and most of us, I would say that's how we define ourselves and to have that kind of taken away. And all there, there was, was like zoom comedy, which um, I also appreciate the people who did that, but it certainly didn't give you the feedback and the things that you needed. And to um, one of the times that I did your guys' show um, was the few times where I was like, Oh, I feel like I really felt good those days. And there was a couple of the shows like the ocean mic and stuff, but like the low key outside shows, I think really did a lot um, for comedians and audiences, uh, mental health and, and for my mental health. So I want to say thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and then also I really enjoyed um, having an opportunity to watch your special so that I, what I love in a in comedy and what I enjoy in a special is when I can watch it and feel like I learned a lot about that person and a lot about their perspective. And I think with your special, the Detroit player special uh, that people can see on YouTube, uh, you did exactly that. I learned so much more about you. I learned about your perspective, your spirituality, your, your views on um, race and, and so many things, but in a um, very chill and laid back way. Um, I learned that you are an Italian, which I assume. (laughs) (laughs) Yo, me too. <laughs> That's why I think when I first introduced you, I was like, Paul Elia. <laughs> yeah, I do sound like a pasta. <laughs> a lot of people are disappointed. <laughs> Rocky, all right. Yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> Yeah, they got pasta there. <laughs> That's an Olive Garden somewhere. <laughs> uh, so I really like that. I really enjoy the, the opportunity to watch because usually when I see you, it's just like I'm popping in and out of shows. I maybe I've seen you do like a five or ten minute set, but I never really got to see your work like that. And so um, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you, man. You know, I. Uh, I feel like I know you just through Blair, like Blair talks so much about you. You're like, you know, really such an inspiration in her life. So I feel like I know you just through like the stories that Blair says and like the advice you give her and, you know, which I think it's so important, bro, to like give our friends advice and encouragement and even starting off with like loving words. That's important, you know, like yeah. Hollywood meetings, like they do the opposite. <laughs> they just sit there like, hey, so what are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. You, you call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's also, I mean, it's just good to have real authentic friendships and comedy. And that's, um, as I've gotten older, it's just been rarer. Cause I feel like I came in pretty naive where I was like, Oh, if you're a comedian and we're all brothers and sisters and I would do for you like you would do for me and um, I learned through local Portland comedy quickly I was like oh wait no there's like pirates and weirdos and, and uh, sexual assaultists <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> sexual assaultist? <laughs> it should be a title <laughs> like that's what they're into yeah, yeah I think that's the plural form <laughs> yeah 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 they pluralized it yeah and you go like oh I can't just because you have this job title doesn't mean you're my friend and so so um, to, when I have someone that I see like Blair, who's just like genuinely nice and kind to people and a hard worker, and it's like hard not to root for her and want her to win and try to give her advice. And um, do you, who's like that for you, Paul? Man, uh, so many people, you know, like uh, I would say definitely Rami Youssef. He was my roommate for many years. And uh he always, he's always available for me. You know, if I ever need him for anything, he's there for me. Um, same thing with Mo Amer. He's the homie. Uh, Ian Edwards, mm-hmm. you know, Ian Edwards was, uh, I think, yeah, I would say early on, I was like, maybe it was like 2016. This is when Ian's uh, special came out on Comedy Central. And we were like friendly. It was sort of like, you know, in and out. He'd see me perform a bit and I would say what up to him. And we'd have like, you know, decently meaningful conversations. You know, like he would come by and be like, hey, man, that's a cool jacket. I'm like, oh, I got it from here. And he goes, man, I had a jacket like that. 
and I can't find it. I think that's it. And then I'd be good, man, I'm just playing. And I'm like, oh, hilarious. You know, cause I'm like, look at him like my senior. And I'm like, is he someone I can like riff with? Is he mm-hmm. someone that's like cool? So, you know, I, I just always was mindful of that distance. Cause there's some people, especially when you're a young comic, you like see somebody that's, you know, you want to riff with. And they're just like, nah, I ain't trying to riff with you right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, my bad. So like Ian was always, he didn't look at where I was at in the game. He just looked at me as a human being. And then we started to get, uh, really close and we started doing sketches together and yeah he's like always there for me good friend and honest friend honest friend which is i think so important it's important to have a friend that will like tell you the real shit and not just like gas you up or lie to you or tell you what you want to hear like he'll be like listen this strategy is terrible that mm-hmm. you're doing you should consider this consider this you need to be this way you know and that's what i needed you know, I didn't really have a whole lot of people to like do that. Like my family does that to me, but their advice is just like, you need to quit. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is that real? Are they not supportive at first? I guess I mean, it make it, it's a classic story if that's not true. Yeah. It's just, that's true. it's just money is the measure of success, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, if the more money you make in whatever field you're doing, you're great. Like in my community, weed was considered so awful. It was like the devil. And then a bunch of Arabs and Middle Eastern people found ways to open up dispensaries. Now they're like, you know, weed's a plant, Mm -hmm. you know, it's medicine and they're making money off of it. Now they're drug dealers, Mm -hmm. you know? And before it was like, if I was caught with weed or anything, it was like be the hugest issue, you know, now they're smoking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, my mom, like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You Middle Eastern too, Iraqi. <laughs> this whole time, we need you, bro. <laughs> well, I feel like there's a lot of crossover in culturally, and that's one of the things I really liked about your special is like, in so many ways, you talk like a black comic, and it's really fun to watch. And it's like clear that, and I imagine I don't know, I'm gonna ask. Um, so since you grew up in Detroit, I imagine there was a lot of um, mixed culture and a lot of black influence in your life from an early age? Yeah. I mean, my neighborhood, it was very few Middle Eastern people, all black. Um, I used to wear do-rags. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bro. why you got those waves. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like, like and, then, and then my homies that, you know, my, my black friends I grew up with, they're like, you know, that does nothing, right? <laughs> And I'm like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I was wearing FUBU, Fat Albert. <laughs> and the thing is, I would I would get beat up for being fake black, mm-hmm. which is not a hate crime. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I just, I just wanted to, I always wanted to be something different than what I was. Mm-hmm. Like, I'd never really... Uh, growing up, I just had a lot of like conflicting feelings about myself. And I think that's why I'm able to like do impressions of people and be an actor and do some of these things. And just in the neighborhood, I was just assimilating to what I was around. And I just, yeah, when I was younger, I tell people I was light skinned. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, he, he like John B. <laughs> I'm like, that's my dad. Paul E. John B. <laughs> John B's black, right? I believe so. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. It doesn't matter. We have accepted him. <laughs> yeah, he's been accepted. Yeah. Him, Justin Bieber, Bobby Caldwell. Bobby Caldwell. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about Bobby Caldwell? No, but I've heard his name a few Bobby times. Bobby Caldwell was an R&B. I could tell how you respond when you repeated it back in a tone that was a little less confident. Yeah. <laughs> John B was mad confident. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, Bobby. Bobby Caldwell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He has that one joint where it's like, bah. Yeah. <laughs> he had a lot of R&B jams, and he had a very soulful, almost black voice. And so his record company every album cover would just be like illustrated. They would, didn't want to show him because they didn't want to reveal he was white. And then he'd like go on tour and people be like, Oh, you know? Right. And so I always thought that was really interesting. And that, that was neither here nor there, but I thought that was a fun story. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, people probably show up and they're like, when's Bobby called? <laughs> <laughs> they got this white guy tuning up. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 like the white guy's good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> He's doing covers of Bobby's song. <laughs> 
I guess Bobby's sick. He got COVID or something. <laughs> <laughs> Probably before it came out. Yeah, but. it was. But well, I mean, Bobby, he died recently. So maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but what? So you talked about growing up having conflict with the, being yourself. Can you tell me a bit more about that? What do you mean? Expound on that. Yeah, I was. Uh, I just wanted like I didn't want to do the traditional route that my parents were pushing me towards. Like I felt like they were just like, go to school, study, don't do sports, just learn and make money. Mm. Like my parents didn't teach me Arabic. They didn't teach me Sudith, which is the language that Assyrians speak. They were just like, just learn how to read good English and make money, be a doctor, be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then I was always into sports. I was always into music. And like, it's hilarious. Like looking at all this wrestling memorabilia, like I loved wrestling. Like I used to cut promos on a tape recorder and I'd be like, oh, if I was Paul Bear's son, or if I were to be like the undertaker's nephew, mm -hmm. how would I come out and just cut a promo? And like, I just- Yeah, no, don't just say that, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, undertaker, I have another nephew. <laughs> His name is Paul Aaliyah, and he wears do rags, <laughs> and he's gonna raise hell. <laughs> oh, we used to call my aunt Paul Bear. Which... <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it, pretty rude. Yeah. <laughs> that was rude. <laughs> sounds like something that in church sounds like a church position. <laughs> Is that a palm Give bear? That old palm bear. <laughs> and now the palm bear? <laughs> she laying in peace. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's an, well, what you talk about with um, basically your parents being wanting you to kind of assimilate to the culture that you were in and in many ways making it seem like you were disconnected from more of your uh, Iraqi culture. I don't want to speak for you, but is that something? Okay. You're shaking your head. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. No, it. no. For, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Like, but I feel like that's, I mean, that's also similar in, in black culture. You get a lot of that where, I mean, the fact that like, one of your jokes that I re related to a lot where you talk about how your name is Paul and you were like, oh, I'm not Iraqi at all with a name like Paul. And I, my name is Ronald Kyle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all the like, John B is more black. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like for if you get on the job applications, you know, it was a thing that my parents and my mom had to think about of being like, oh, do I want them to see like a Daquan or, a, or Ronald Kyle? And they don't know who this is. And it's a shame that they had to think like that. Now, I try to I think in many ways our generation tries to go to reverse of where I'm like, well, I'll just do whatever I want. And you just have to accept me for who I am to the point where I named my son. Tadal and my <laughs> other son Teddy Bear. So, <laughs> like, I don't know if there's even a person. <laughs> it's an NFT about a walk through this. <laughs> um, so, how have you? Did you ever feel a need to like reconnect with that side of you, or how does that? Because you, how does that work within you? I feel like that is conflicting. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I was, uh, I, I legit was like, I'm you know, I identify with black culture. Like I was like on some Rachel Dolezal vibes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this just- Started an OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> Started an OnlyMans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was just like, um, and I, I feel like as I started to, it, you know, cause I just identified with like, it's not necessarily like black culture. It was just like, you know, we were, we all didn't have a lot of money. We were all like, you know, like I would get into trouble a lot. I would get into fights all the time as a kid. And uh, like eventually, you know, when I got into high school, like, and I would talk to teachers, it was hard for me to get my grades readjusted when I'm like, yo, teach, what's up with this grade? And then they would just be like, you know, you, there needs to be more, uh, you know, what is this? This is an act or something. I don't know what this is, you know, but, and then I feel like as I started to get older, especially when I started getting into comedy, I was just like, how come I don't talk about like who I am? Hmm. You know, and I feel like when I was like, when I was in school, it was like something that was like, you know, we can only be who we are. We can be who God made us. And you can either have a choice to run away from that and be something completely different and dress a certain way and be a certain way, which a lot of people do. 
and rightfully so for whatever reason they escape it i mean but at the end of the day it's going to circle back around and i felt like with comedy when i was like struggling to find topics that were so different because a lot of my jokes i felt like were like oh that's kind of like this guy's joke Mm -hmm. oh that's kind of like this premise and Mm -hmm. it's like i feel like the misdirect is very common and then when i was able to talk about my identity i was like man this is something that's so different and it was just the funniest content and it was what people remembered yeah at the end of the show they were like man it's so interesting that you talk about how you're a practicing non-muslim that's so i never heard that before i never heard of the word chaldean or assyrian i don't even know what these things are and Mm -hmm. it's like wow i like learned something so i felt like i was doing a disservice by not doing the work and diving into it no i think that's (laughs) absolutely right i think that's um why why i responded to the special is and what i love in good comedy in general is just i am learning a new perspective and i think um i i also i mean i had that kind of at an open mic one day i just saw in portland like we were just i came up in a good time and there were some really funny people and some people that were really sharp and some people who were much more extroverted than i am and continue to be um what up malcolm um and at a certain point i was like okay there's gonna be people who write better jokes than me people who have more stage presence than me um but you can't out me me oof damn and i was like so that's what i gotta work on is diving deeper into myself and what separates me and what embar- what has embarrassed me, what I've gone through, what my life has been about. And that's always served me well. Um, and so I like that. I love hearing that from you. Man, Out Me Me is fire, bro. Thank you. That is fire. Thank you. We got to put that on like something, on like a mug or something. Yeah. Well, you put it too close together. It just says meme. So <laughs> <laughs> out Me Me? <laughs> <Who's> me, me? <laughs> You're like, see, you, you, you don't get it. <laughs> Ron Funch's Mimi tour. <laughs> yeah, man, that, that's real talk, man. I mean, I, I felt like I just, my parents didn't teach me a lot about my culture. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't really teach me the language, which I feel like language is like the most important thing in like really learning who you are and identifying yourself. Like, you know, Sudith, which is the language that Assyrians speak is considered the first documented language ever in history. And even the writings, they still, the writings from B, like the BC era are still the ones used today. And that ancient language is something that I'm like, man, I got to learn this now. And I, I'm having such a hard time learning, but I'm like, I just got to try to do what I can mm. to learn this. So I want to do right by me, mm. you know, and I want to talk about that more. And it's just like, you're right. Like you, People can out write and out joke and out act out, but you know, we can only be who we are. So that's what I'm really trying to lean into. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, one thing that you talked about uh, when relating to the black community and then talking about like we're going through the same struggles and we're, we were doing this and you were so you related to it. One thing that I wanted to talk to you about was you had jokes about 9 11 and being kind of then socially, you're kind of culturally an enemy of America, even though not the people who committed those acts. Um, And I always find that interesting because I think that is another thing that bonds the two cultures of being presented as a foe, as an enemy. And in fact, I remember in Chicago and where I live, there was almost kind of like this, not a celebratory thing, but there was like a sigh of relief that it went from like the 80s and 90s when I grew up you see all every commercial of like ADT or whatever it's always like black thugs people coming to rob you and ski mask and it was all about white flight and all this stuff and then 9-11 happens and then it's all like this Iraqi and Muslim and, and Arab hatred and it was kind of like whoo <laughs> <laughs> let somebody else get a turn for a little bit <laughs> Yeah, man. It's like the shift from the attitude era. 
<laughs> yeah, they went from the Hogan era. They went from the, the Japanese hatred to black. It just, oh, black was always in the back. We always either a strong number two or number one. We <laughs> was number, number two seed. <laughs> yeah, perennial contenders. <laughs> but what was that? I mean, do you relate to that growing up or during that time period? Because I imagine, how old are you? 36. 36. So I was in high school when this happened. So you would have been probably in like middle school or so. Right? Yeah, I was uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade. Well, can you, what, was there a shift for you in how people perceived you or how they looked at you or, were, or because you were in a black community? Was that different? Or you just tell me what it was like. I'm, I'm leading you. Yeah. Well, well, when I was in seventh grade, like I was still telling people I was light skinned. Mm -hmm. So like it wasn't really, uh, and also people just always looked at me and they're like, this guy's not Middle Eastern. This dude's Italian. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so like nobody what was uh really putting hate on me like that or any slurs, but what they would do is they would talk about it in front of me and I would hear the things they would say and I would be put in this position where I'm like, do I defend or do I just not say anything? And for a lot of the time, which I regret and what I'm talking about in my next special is that I didn't say anything. Like people would talk about Arabs and Muslims and Iraqis and they're like, man, fuck these Iraqis are doing this. And in my mind, I'm like, but they didn't do anything. Iraq didn't do anything. Like I'd see my mom watch the news and cry all the time. My dad crying all the time. Like my dad would be like, <clears throat> there was a car bombing and my friend died and he didn't even do anything. This guy's walking with groceries, like to bring it to his family. And it was so the Iraqis were were victims, and they were they were then that country so wounded, and then people would then and have the audacity to be like Iraqis are terrorists because George Bush said so, you know. So I, when I was a kid, I had a hard time with, and I wanted to defend people, I wanted to defend my people, but I just didn't know how. And then eventually I did, which I talk about in my next hour. I had an opportunity to like say something, and I did, and I didn't care what was going to happen to me. You know, it was someone that I, I was playing basketball at the time and it was someone that was working in the, uh, on the team and he wasn't the coach. He was like one of the coaches. And I was like, this guy likes me and he's going to put, he puts me in the game and he said something. And I was like, I don't care if I get kicked off the team, I'm going to defend my mom's people. Like I didn't even identify myself as like, I'm Iraqi. Cause I never been there. I don't speak the language. I just felt very white. You know what I'm saying? And but I still felt like I have to say something. So I did. And he respected it. He was like, my bad. And I was like, oh man, I, I got to just do this more often. And then, so I always had an opportunity, whenever I had the opportunity to say something, I would, you know? So, um, and a lot of my friends, I would feel them. Like a lot of my friends who do have like super Arab names, like Farouk and Abdullah mm -hmm. and these guys, like I see them in school and like people, and, like they would tell me stories of like how they're profiled and, you know, it broke my heart, made me sad. So that's why I feel like, in my special, I was like, I have to have an opportunity to say something. If I have, like one of my most important lines is when I talk about that. And I'm like, if I can get that off and if everyone else says everything else is whack, but that one line is dope, I feel like I did my job. I like that. You're a very spiritual guy, huh? Yeah, I mean, try to be. Yeah, I like that. Um, how do you feel about, your special has been out for a few weeks. You said you're working on new stuff. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about with comedians is that time after you drop the special, like, so I always feel like it's such a weird mix of emotions. So how, how has it been for you? How is the like writing new material and stuff been for you? How do you feel? Um, now that the Detroit player available on YouTube for free, uh, is available to watch. How, how are you feeling right now? I feel good. I feel good. I feel like when it came out, I just try to suppress any emotion of just like what I'm really feeling. And then I'm starting to, you know, see my actions and my behavior is given a lot of information. Like it's like, cool. You're checking the views constantly. You're checking to see the new comments. I'm checking to see if anyone comments to say something and to comment on their comment just to keep the algorithm going. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm just like, I have alerts on. And um, that part of it is something that um, I'm learning a lot about myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's like, obviously, I we all want our specials to blow up and have millions of views. So when you drop it 
And like, I remember right when I dropped it, I was, I was with my fiance and I'm looking at the views and I'm just like, it's at 58 views. And she goes, it's been up for 45 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, but I got 60,000 subscribers. Like the numbers should be a better, uh, up more. And then she put her hand on my shoulder and then she was like, it's only been up for under an hour. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah. Like mm -hmm. she goes, it took me two times to get through to you. So then I'm just like, man, I think I just need to uh, relax more. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do that more and more. Um, but I'm just so proud of the work. Like views aside, whatever people see, however many times it gets shared, whoever comments on it, I'm proud of the work, you know? And like, you know, you're, you're someone I deeply respect, like someone like you watching it and having good things to say about it means a lot, you know? And that's what I wanted. I wanted to put something together where if they watch it, they'll be like, yo, this is fire. I know this guy. This is my introduction to the world. And, you know, not that I haven't done a bunch of other things, but like, I feel like this is my solo act where I can be like, yeah. this is my work. So I feel very blessed that it is out. I feel very confident in the work and what I wrote and what I said. And in terms of views and everything else, I'm just learning that that's out of my control. Mm -hmm. All I can do is just keep pushing, keep going. You know, I hired a publicist team. You know, I, I had money saved. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, hey, man, let them do what they do. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, getting write-ups in, you know, a bus route magazine. And I'm like, man, that, that that's a trade. Okay. I like <laughs> that. Trade. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more of a fan of social media managers than um, publicists currently, but that's my thing. That's my <laughs> private way I view things. And I say it if a comedian I know has a publicist, because I know they're very expensive and sometimes they lock you into pretty long-term deal that you got to deal with. Yeah. Them. Four years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, damn. Yeah, you got it. You, you on your NFL second contract. With yeah. I'm like, why do y'all have direct withdrawals? Like, oh. uh, but and they're garnishing my wages. <laughs> yeah, you definitely could have got on this without a publicist, for sure. Um, <laughs> easily. Easily. Just texted Blair. <laughs> And Blair's like, you give me the money, pal. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> you're crazy. Uh, but I just say, what's your special? I'll tell you, say a couple of things you could take or leave. Uh, but I think the best thing that I like, especially with a debut special, is when you can present the best that you are at that moment and introduce someone to yourself and your worldview. And I can leave, like I said, knowing more about you. And I think you nailed that completely. So you should be very proud of it. Um, the view wise, I will say something to you that was told to me when I was like tripping because I was like, Oh, I'm on a show. Why does the Netflix want to do it? The comedy central people aren't going to see it. And, um, uh, Bill Lawrence, who does the, the uh, scrubs and the Ted Lassos and all that stuff, I was talking to him about it, and he was just like, "It doesn't worry about how many people see it. He's like, the right people will see it, and that's what I've found is that like I've gone to different casting things or been straight up offered roles and stuff because the right people saw it, and I didn't need that." millions of people to see it i needed that casting agent to see it i needed that um i needed maya rudolph to see it i needed these people to see it you know not everybody and so i would just say that when you put out your authentic work like that and are really yourself that that's what happens the right people see it and these type of things have a longer tail than you imagine i put out my first and currently only hour special about four years ago and i still we just put out a clip like two weeks ago got like 600 something thousand views because the jokes still are good they weren't based on this is going on now so da, da, da. it was based on me and my life so sometimes i will just say in truth sometimes people just aren't ready yet you know, and especially if you're writing truly for you and writing truly things, sometimes they take a minute for people to catch on. And what when they do and they see it, because I imagine, man, if, if I was some 
um, Iraqi American kid who grew up similar to you, or if I was just a black kid, or even just a white kid who don't know that type of life, and I see that work, and I see what you did, I'm gonna be like, oh man, like this dude's my dude. This is my shit. He, because I can relate to him, and I learn more about him, and I want to support him, and that's different than just someone who's just like putting out jokes, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, just you, you're on the right path of what you're doing. I mean, that's pretty much what i thought the whole time i watched it i was like man he really is like um you're finding yourself and coming into your own and it really shows and and that's special and you said you're like 36 right 36 so, yeah, yeah yeah and i just feel like man when you get 40 when you get like you're gonna be really really doing some great stuff and finding your own um lane and so I would don't don't worry about. It. I mean, you got, I'm glad you got a good circle around you, like your fiance, because she's right. Don't worry about those views. Don't worry about any of that stuff. You, you're putting out good work, and keep working hard because I think you are just kind of scratching the surface of what you can do. It, it feels that way, man. You know, and the not letting the Hollywood hype and numbers and algorithm mm -hmm. get to us is, you know, like I, I rewatched A Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you've you seen it, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm ruining it for you, Christian, but uh, phenomenal movie. I saw it. You saw it? All right, cool. So um, Russell Crowe's character, uh, he keeps seeing these images, these people, and you find out that these people are just a part of his own creation. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the film, they're still there. They're the, the, these images and these people in his mind, but they're just not talking to him no more. So it's like this need for like validation and views will always be there in some way. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the work that we can do to turn the volume down on that is the move. So it's just like being able to like not let it bother me or affect me or make me feel down or not make me want to write. Like, you know, I haven't checked the views in uh, a few days and I've just been writing more and I've been finding more stuff. So I'm just like, man, this is, I feel better already. So it's like, mm -hmm. there's the evidence. So um, I'm just, and just in general, just not letting Hollywood hype get to me where it's like, you see something on TV that you think you should do, or, you know, uh, certain people that should be fucking with us that are not fucking with us or mm -hmm. people getting stuff. So it's oh, like that. Yeah, Joe, I know. <laughs> yeah. All that shit, <laughs> <laughs> all that shit, bro. It's, you know, it's just all hype, man. And it's, is it difficult comparatively with because you and Matt are, are friends and work together and stuff? Was that is that ever a difficulty? Honestly, it's because he's such a good friend and him and I, we really bonded over our failures together. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that he's obviously touring and I didn't know how our the dynamic of the relationship would shift because also he's young. He's 27. Mm hmm. And I was just fully accepting the fact that if he's completely on some Hollywood, whatever, I just got to let him do his thing. And he's still my bro. And I'm gonna love him from afar and let him just do his thing. And then eventually be like, bro, my door's always open. Welcome home, bro. What do you need? And that was not the case, man. Like right when he got his tour, his first show, he was like, I need, I want you to open for me. When he was doing his special, Netflix was like, we have our own producers. He goes, no, I have Paul Aaliyah. He's going to produce this with me. So he fought for me to produce it. And then he's like, why do I have to fight to get Paul to produce my special? Like, I want him to produce it. Got me to do it. Same thing with Eric Griffin. He really wanted Eric Griffin to direct it. Mm -hmm. He goes, Eric's going to direct it. So um, I'm really uh, grateful for Matt. And like, you know, whatever I need, he's like, you want me to share something? I'll share it. You want to come on the road with me, do these dates, come do them. So he's he's always there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he'll bring me on stage, big up me. We're doing merch. He'll like, make sure to buy his merch. So, you know, he's, he's doing more than what I feel like is, yeah. you know, like, I don't expect anything. No, he's the, he, it's always one of the things that I say when people are talking shit, because it's like just classic comedies. Like you want the business to do well, but you don't, you prefer it if it was you who were at the top, you know, and we need someone like Matt who's bringing in people who, who or the mainstream it, it makes uh, everybody do better and that's when the number one thing i just like in anyone is that when you get blessed like that when when the fortune smiles upon you that you do 
take your friends and you help your friends and you and you do the best by the community and he always has done that and that's something i talked to him the last time i saw him i was like man i know people talk so much shit about you but i also know so many of my friends like my friend dayton bissett who i think is so fucking funny and he's like in his 20s and he's poor as shit and he can and he's struggling through it and people like matt are keeping him alive and i have so much appreciation for that and so I always, when, when when I hear stuff like what you're saying, I, I love that because I think that's all you're supposed to do in comedy is, is when you get your foot through the door, hold, hold, try to hold it open for your friends who are work, who not to give them things, but to see if they can take advantage of opportunities like you have. Mm-hmm. And that's all you can do and just be there to support them like the friends you've always been. And I've seen so many people do that and I've seen so many people not do that. And so when someone does it, I can, no matter what someone thinks about their material or whatever, I'm I'm like, no, you like this dude is a job creator. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you gotta give it up for the job creator. Yeah, I thought that was what our whole thing was here. <laughs> yeah, he's a front line worker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we gotta bring our pots and pans when we see Matt. <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, were you at that meeting where he sucked the 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 executives? <laughs> <laughs> I was the boom operator. I was like, I don't know why y'all need sound. <laughs> Did you see that video yeah, from that I guy? That Imagine so. And I was just like, oh my god, what a bitter fucking dude. First of all, this. Oh, oh if you haven't seen it, go out of your way. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a fun video and the guy's like I was on my way I was actually pretty successful I'm like I've never heard of the never heard fucking of him. life dude and I, I thought he was the dude from the mummy yeah <laughs> I was like, weren't you an actor? I've been this thing for 17 years. I've never seen that face in my life. And then he was just like, oh, the two executives, they said, if you suck our dicks, then you can get internet fame, which is very specific. <laughs> <laughs> I said no and left the room, but then he was sucking it. And then I was just thinking about like, just say if that was true. Someone needs to teach those executives the average cost of blowjobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the retail value yeah, of blowjobs? It's certainly not a full-fledged career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, inflation is crazy. Yeah, you are overpaying. <laughs> And Two then, dicks? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I was like, nobody offered it to you with those thin lips that you got. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No goes, way. Yeah, but my bald, man, it feels good. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, also, I was thinking, he said that he was sitting on a couch with Matt, and then he said, suck both our dicks. And he got up, and then before he can get to the door, Matt was sucking their dicks. I'm like, how far was this door? Yeah, it was a long door. <laughs> like, to where the guys can unzip their pants, get over, get hard. <laughs> like, is this like the Matrix hallway? <laughs> it's a very nice office. And then he goes, hang on, what are you doing? Did you get binoculars? <laughs> yeah. He didn't think to take pictures. He didn't think to... <laughs> Did yeah, that? bro. He's like, this is just a story I'm going to tell 15 years from now to capitalize off of a whole Cat Williams thing and then you see it all the time I just, just I hate when people disregard hard work and I know um, that people get shit just tossed to them but I'm also I mean fuck if you just in comedy you no know, Matt for fucking over a decade like you've seen him just fucking climb and going up from back when his website when he was like 17 was like I'm the fastest rising comedian <laughs> And I was like, you self fucking prophesized that. And then he did it. So it's beautiful. Um, but uh, I just hate that shit because I see the thing when it's like other black comedians. You see it a lot in the black comedy community too because I saw a comedian where they were like, if you've been in more than three movies, you definitely done suck the dick. And then I was like, damn, I've been in like nine movies. So, <laughs> so that means three dicks. Yeah, it's the least three dicks that I apparently suck. Here going to my dick back. And again, the price too too high for yeah. <laughs> like come on I would have sucked those dicks for much cheaper but <laughs> I'm like man just help my special get worse. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, have Kanye share it. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. I just hate it. It's just sometimes you can work, people work hard and struggle and beat their fucking heads against walls until shit happens. And I don't know. I don't know where I was going with it, but this was fun. Fun conversation. No, but but like that video, like we we, we have a group chat and like obviously we like shared it amongst the group chat and Matt's like 100% I'm just suing this guy mm -hmm. for like what he said for this type of defamation. And um, yeah, bro, it's like, and I was telling Matt, I was like, bro, this is a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. People are going to say more and more things about you. Mm -hmm. People like even, you know, uh, people are mentioning the jaw surgery. Mm -hmm. People are mentioning the lip filler. And it's like, you know, he never got those things. And then I was like, Matt, but you do got to agree. Like your lips did get a little more plump. Yeah, they did. Get they get a little more plump. More, plump. <laughs> more of a chiseled jawline. Yeah. Uh, but I just say, who gives a fuck? I don't give a fuck either way. I mean, to me, this was the most callable thing that I could <laughs> saw. I remember again when I met him, I was like, this fucking little cute, little fucking cutie. I was like this. He's like, oh, I'm fucking struggling. And I'm like, you're fucking fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, you fine and you fine. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be fine. You're fine. You give you, if all else goes to hell, you can live off some divorcee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll be fine. So to see him get so successful is not a surprise to me to where I understand why people People have to come up with these fucking conspiracies and different shit. It's just like, why can't you just be like, oh, he's traditionally attractive and he writes jokes and he fucking is on his business. Easy to figure out. Yeah. And his crowd work, like his wit is so fast. Like this dude is so quick and he's so good at what he does. You know, and I'm and I feel like just my POV is just so much different because I'm with him when we're writing jokes up until like three in the morning. We're at the Laugh Factory and he's like, what do you think of this tag? And we're like tagging each other's shit and writing. And, you know, like like you mentioned with low key, like, you know, we're setting up chairs and we're just like, you know, trying to like get the show going and we're like going over jokes. So it's like, you know, he's put in work and bro, he's only 27. Like when he's 36, when he's 40, mm -hmm. like I think his comedy and like where he's at and like what he's going to talk about. I think it's just gonna, you know, continue to grow, bro. Like he's, he's hungry. Continue to grow co comedically. Yes. Successfully. It seems hard to maintain. I don't know how you can get, it seems difficult. He's going to headline Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> But I suppose for that's why I also like um, watching people like Dane Cook have kind of taken him under his wing a little bit to just kind of help him na navigate that thing. Because that's one thing that I love about Dane is that he reached this level. I mean, I've had people on here like that. That's one thing I love to talk about in this podcast. Like I had Stone Cold on here and stuff like that. Oh. When you reach such a level of fame that is not beatable at a certain age and you still have more to do later what's that like and i think having someone like dane who continues to work out continues to do comedy i think he's funnier than he's ever been like he's so fucking he does these bits of the factory that i'm just like fuck here you are fucking it's clear you are a seasoned work hard like you put an effort comedian and it's so cool to see that, especially when so many people don't like to give him credit. And so I feel like Matt with the, you know, if he keeps on the path, he'll have the same thing. Like maybe, you know, there'll be a time where he's not selling out super arenas or maybe he will for a long, long I wish that cause that helps my friends. Yeah. Uh, but either way, I think that what we don't want and what I don't think happened from him is like burnout and then disappear. I don't think that's going to happen for him because he's got a good level head and good people around him. So, uh, but I came here to mostly talk about you so we can switch back to you if you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, you know, it, like he, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this. It's like, you know, he's it's such a huge part in my, you know, career, you know, and like he also produced my special executive mm -hmm. produced it. So, you know, shout out to him, man. I'm so grateful for him. Yeah. Absolutely. I like Matt. Um, tell me about more of your goals now that you've achieved your your special and you're working on things. We're big in the goals here, whether it's uh, career-wise, spiritual, uh, health-wise, family, whatever you're willing to share. Um, what are you working on? I'm going to announce a tour. I'm going to do 13 Cities. Um, exclusive! Exclusive, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you got that sound effect? We can Third add it. City. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I'm just, I'm just very ready. You know, like I feel like uh, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm writing from a very real, honest place right now. Um, and I feel like after I did the special, it's like I got my first, you know, first game in and I'm like, cool. I now know the landscape. I know how to do this. 
So I'm ready for this tour. Um, we got the, we're shooting a low key comedy show uh, special. Nice. We're doing it at the Netflix Fest. So that's going to be May 8th. And um, I got my own show. I'm headlining a show at the Netflix Fest. So a lot of comedy uh, in terms of writing projects. I'm, you know, I have a few projects I'm working on right now. So I'm chiseling away at those. Um, I had two torn rotator cuffs for the last year. Mm. And I got them from boxing. Okay. And it was like really uh, starting to depress me because like a lot of things I tried, like I still tried to do and I wasn't able to. And I would just fight through the pain. And I just put myself through so much agony. Mm -hmm. And then like, I would like do something like grab cereal. And then my shoulders are hurting for like two days because I extended it so hard. So I'm doing physical therapy. I got steroid injections. So I feel so much better, so much better. So health, I'm doing yoga and definitely taking care of my body. Um, Man, I've been watching a lot of uh, documentaries, watching a lot of wrestling documentaries, Dark Side of the Ring. Mm -hmm. I got Peacock. I'm watching a bunch of things and just uh, trying to digest as much content and just uh, just different stories from different entertainers and how they're navigating the game and their struggles. So I'm working on that. And uh, me and my fiance, we're going to most likely I'm going to be bi-coastal, man. I'm going to go back and forth from L.A. to Detroit. Okay. Yeah. You're going to try this. Okay. I hate, this is a lot going on. I see a lot of people are moving to regular cities and trying to live a regular life. That's what you're trying to do with, you, with your fiance? In case you guys imagine maybe this is in order to possibly build a family? Yeah. I mean, also, like, my parents are getting older mm-hmm. and they just, they need me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I see, like, you know, your, you know, your mom's here and, you know, you're, you know, you take care of your kids and, you know, you're a, uh, you got a lot of responsibility and you're a man and there's things bigger than you that, and all this is for them. And that's what I want to do. You know what I mean? It's like when I go home to Detroit and I see like my dad's having a hard time getting up off the couch and I'm just like, bro, I need to be here for this dude, man. So fuck career, fuck all that. This is what matters. And this is what like my heart is telling me, you know, like it, if it's something I keep thinking about and I, when I go to bed, I just keep thinking about my dad trying to get up and I keep thinking about my mom not knowing how to pay her bills because she don't understand the computer. And then I want to open it up and like, mom, you put it on auto pay. She goes, no, I don't trust the government. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this ain't that. Oh, cool. Again, black family. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, black families don't believe in auto pay. Black families don't trust the government for sure. My grand- <laughs> great grandma hid, hid most of her money in her, under her mattress for most of her life. And it was like, oh, if I, and it was because, I mean, my great grandma was like old enough that she was a daughter of a slave and so she you know was coming in out of telling and she's literally someone at a bank was like if you ever put your money in the, i'm gonna take your money and so she always lived with like the white man's gonna come and take my money so i gotta hide it under the mattress so that my family can take it um, <laughs> She goes, can you believe the government took money under the mattress? Like, Man, that's they crazy. found it. <laughs> you better move spots again. My sleep number changed. <laughs> <laughs> would she count it? Like, would she like? She just leave it there. She goes, I trust that. Probably. I mean, I don't. I I I didn't steal it, so I didn't look into it. Because my mom, my mom would also hide money, but like, mm-hmm. and she would always count it. Like every now and then, like every month, she would like count it just to like make sure it's still there. So I'm just like. I know she thinks either like we're taking it or like we know where it is, but also like she kept hiding in different spots. Like my mom was like very paranoid about Mm -hmm. money and you know, like money was like so important. Also she grew up with such little money and like for so long of my upbringing, I grew up with such little money that, you know, money, even my mom says it, she's like, my first name is money. My last name is money. And like, you know, my mom, she's, you know, great businesswoman. I'm an awful businessman. (laughs) Like when I got my first like big check, like I got a check from doing a commercial and this was like 350 commercials deep of auditioning, Mm -hmm. never booked one. And then I finally booked one. And then I spent all of it on a blue Jeep Wrangler. Yeah, that's not, yeah, that's not a good move. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I heard that from my financial advisor. (laughs) Did you have a financial advisor at that time? No, no, no. Because I would have have hoped you would have. (laughs) (laughs) If they were 
like, 100%? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yo, all the money. And the thing that was wild is that I was just like, oh, after I booked this commercial, I'm about to book everything after this. Yeah. Didn't book anything. Still going to open mics, pulling up in a $45,000 car. Mm. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this car. So I'm doing like catering gigs. Mm. I'm like doing valet. And thing is, I'm pulling up in cars and the people are just like, yo, man, you got a fire ass Jeep, bro. Like, and you're doing catering. And I'm just like, and I put myself in such a difficult position. Overextended. Overextended, man. That's so interesting. And I feel like now that I, I'm going to tell you something that I did, which I now I'm like, why did I do that? That's weird. But it helped me the fuck out is that when I was getting into comedy, I would study the like, way other people had work and the way that their career trajectory went. And I would be like, and I would look and I would notice patterns and I would be like, and it's all through IMDB and I would see, and I'd be like, okay, so this, I like this comedian and all right, they were in this thing once. Oh, they didn't book another thing for two more years. And then they booked this and then the whole little momentum. And then they started booking something every year. Then a couple of years, they didn't book something. Then they book, And I'd be like, oh, that's how it goes. And so when I booked my first thing, and I was like, okay, I in my head, I literally go, I'm probably not going to get another thing for a whole year. And so that's how I navigated it. Right. <laughs> you went the other way. <laughs> yeah, I was like, more's going to come. You were going to see this Honda commercial. <laughs> we need that guy. <laughs> Man, they said the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, well, man. I hope you're doing better now with money, man. Yeah, I'm just like being very careful because, again, yeah, you never know. Like, I got these shows coming up, and I'm just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I might feel like I need another publicist and spend mm-hmm. all my money, yeah, on that. So, I'm yeah, just- I recommend maybe not, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, one, yeah, unless I mean, man, who I don't know what the price is for you. Um, I'm, I mean, do you uh, guess and you, you play higher or lower with me? We could play higher or lower. Okay. Because I know average usually around five grand. Yeah. Higher, lower? No, that sounds about right. About right. <laughs> You're talking about a week, right? <laughs> oh, no. I could have got two G's. <laughs> have you found much use in it currently? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, uh, you know, they, they were very upfront, you know what I'm saying? They were very upfront and it's crazy. Cause like I was getting advice from a lot of friends and they were just like, you know, people were saying, Oh my God, it's such a waste of money. Then some other people were like, Oh, but I was able to get on some lists. I wasn't able to get on. And, you know, so they were very fair and honest. And even when they couldn't do things, they're like, yo, listen, we cannot do this, but we definitely will try to like get you these things. So, and it was a risk I was willing to take. So I I knew all the terms and conditions. Yeah. I think we've all gone through this. I think we talked with this about Blair. I don't want to put her business out there, but, um, and with me, cause I remember my first, I was like, I'm going to get a publicist and I got a publicist. And then I want to put, I don't say the company or anything, but like, I just remember going to a party and seeing them at a party and they were just so fucked up. And then going to another party and seeing them at the party and they were fucked up real bad again. And I was just like, oh, is this what this job is? <laughs> like, are you PBR? just a professional partier? Is that what a publicist is? And then, the, and then I was just getting invited to all these podcasts and things that I already had been invited to. So I was like, oh, this was a waste of my money. Um, so... <laughs> Now I've been really, cause I was like, Oh, I just want to work on my counts and trying to organize. Cause I do so many, you know, voiceover, regular acting, um, hosting, stand up, And I feel like oh, a lot of the people don't meet each other and they mm-hmm. don't know what someone acting doesn't know I do stand up or whatever. And so I'm trying to organize that. And so I got the social media manager on it. And so far I feel like that's been currently feels like a better use of my money. I, it's very new. So it might turn and not be good. But um, so far, I like them more than the publicist. But this isn't, you already spent your money. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 I was so tell like, hey, got some money back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say just in... Um, just not worrying about the, the the views and 
uh, being willing to use the people that you already have access to and just not being afraid to ask for help and just be like, hey, can I do this podcast? Can I do this? Can I? Um, even if you don't know someone that well, I mean, especially cause, like me, me and you, you know, like I know you a little bit. Like you said, I know you mostly through Blair, but knowing that you had a special coming out was all I needed. I was like, yeah, sure. Come on. I mean, I just like to help comedians. Yeah. So um, I think don't ever undervalue that part of it. It's just that you are already connected and sometimes more connected in where you want to be than they are, you know, but um this is used for everything. I don't know if it's a waste of money or not. I think maybe it's good. Yeah. And, and you're a really good dude, man. You know, cause like there are some people who knew I had a special and some other comics that like hit up and, you know, I don't take it personal when people are just like, they don't respond or they'll leave you on red or I'm like, there's probably other things going on that have nothing to do with me at all. But the fact that you offered was like really sweet, man. So I really appreciate it. That's the first thing I told Blair. And I was just like, Ron's so dope, man. He just like asked if I want to be a guest on his pod. Cause like, I also like wanted to ask, like I listened to the pod. I, I love your work. And I was like, you know, I just don't want to, you know, uh, I don't know like how to ask. Cause like I have a, I have a hard time asking. And that's something that I'm trying to get over. I th- Cause I think when I first came to LA, I would always ask. And I was, I was an over asker for things. You know, I would go to events and sneak into events and try and get people's emails and be like, Hey, can you read this? Can you do this? And just willy nilly ask no strategic asking. You know, and I feel like now, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting over that now. So, but I appreciated you uh, inviting me on, man. No, of course. I appreciate you coming. And also I appreciate what you just said, because I think that's important is that sometimes people ask when either they're not ready to take advantage of or they're not asking what strategy, not really having a direction with where they want to go. And one of the best things that I think someone ever told me was my manager when I before she was ever my manager and we just she was just like here take my number but call me you know just call me if something comes up that you need me for and I was like I don't know what the fuck that is and then something came up and I was like this is what I need you for can you help me with this and she was like yeah but you know this is more of like a client thing so maybe I should also be your manager and I was like oh don't she was waiting to see if I was going to go get something, you know, and that's when you ask, when you think, and I've had people like that, like, um, not to name drop or thing, but just be authentic in this thing. It's just like, I saw Lena Waithe at this party and I've known her for so long and been such a big fan of hers and, um, just watched like, it's again, another thing that reminds me of Matt Reif where I'm like, wow, you can really watch someone authentically and traditionally go from this position to being a legit superstar and a legit business creator and an uh, um, icon in many ways. And then they're still cool and still the same person. And she was like, Hey, if you ever need me for something, let me know. And I was just like, maybe something will come up, but I'm not going to just be like, Hey, can you help me do this? Is it, I might have a show idea. I'm like, I will have to have something that comes up that's in her world that I know that she creates and stuff. And if I do, then I'll reach out. But other than that, just knowing that she supports me and cares about me is all I need, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's some of the lesson that a lot of people are either they're afraid to ask or they ask too much and when they're not able to actually take advantage of the help. So that's really, I think that's a lot more poignant and, and like bigger a deal what you just said. And, you know, I didn't want to just gloss over that. Um, yeah, what? for no, I was going to add Please. to that. I feel like um, when I have uh, like a homie that's like, if you need anything, let me know. And I like don't check in with them. And then I need something. I'm just like, I don't want them to feel mm-hmm. that I'm hitting them up just because I need something. But then they're just like, I told you that if you need something, hit me up. It's cool that you're not hitting me up on my birthday. It's okay that you're not checking in on me doing that. And it's just like, you know, I. I Why I, didn't you hit them up on the birthday? Because <laughs> I didn't know it was their birthday. <laughs> and then I saw it. And then I'm like, oh man, it's too it past. And then I text them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, now I'm hitting up everybody on their birthday. Yeah. I wake up in the morning. Oh, And everybody. I'm like, who's My homies? birthday was last week. <laughs> oh, shit, know. Ron. <laughs> 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 Which brings me to my next question. <laughs> you know, birthdays are so sad. 
<laughs> Yo, if your mom brought a cake <laughs> and I'm like, me and Mama Funch is playing. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. See, again, Steve he's black. Yeah, bro. That's the only birthday I know. <laughs> I'm fluent in black birthdays. <laughs> oh, so you picked it right up. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Come on, Chris. Happy birthday. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know bro. You probably do it the Creed version. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> oh, Paul, tell people where they can watch the special, where they can see you perform, how they can get in touch with you. Man, if you go to watch Paul Elia, E L I A dot com, uh, you will see my, my tour dates should be up. Uh, so check that out. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at Paul Aliyah Comedy, E-L-I-A, on Instagram. And my special Detroit player is now available on YouTube. Check it out. And also DM me. Tell me what you think of it. I read all my DMs, so I probably shouldn't. Yeah, is your fi- fiance cool with this? Is this- <laughs> well, well, the thing is, she... <laughs> <laughs> you DM me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, she used to be like very, you know, she's a dentist. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Well, in dental school, dental student. So like I would have like DMs and then like I would just show her. And then I'm like, man, look at these messages. And then she would like read them and look at this girl and she goes, she's ugly. And she was like, delete it. Mm-hmm. She goes, oh, who's this? And she deleted it. She goes, Who's this commenting on your thing? So I'm just like, I would be like, listen, I got nothing to hide. You see it. I'm like, I rock with you. You know, I love you. It's like, I'm not liking, like she saw me one time, like a girl's photo. And then she was like, I saw that you like this photo. And I'm like, babe, this is a very impressive act. Like, you know, she's doing some great yoga movements. (laughs) (laughs) The form, immaculate. (laughs) I'm like, sure, she's thick, but like... (laughs) I'm like, I don't know how to do a handstand. That's what makes it more impressive. <laughs> I see off balance. You know, it's like all, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. I mean, DM me about the special. <laughs> also, happy birthday, Ron. Man. Thank you, know you know so much. <laughs> I'll ask you one last question. I know you got to get out of here. Um, and that's what I ask everybody. Just a little pearl of wisdom, a little nugget of advice, something that uh, maybe you learned recently, something that was passed down to you from your parents. I don't care what it is, just something to help our getting better community to get better. Man, uh, can I say two things? Yes. Okay. (laughs) One thing is that someone gave me this advice. It's uh, uh, every fruit ripens on its own schedule. And that is a process that we should trust. And that was a big, big life note. And the other one is... um, a teaching and uh, I could be butchering it, but uh, uh, it's a uh, Islamic teaching that I, I, I rock with. Um, they say, and again, I am butchering it. So please forgive me. They say uh, when calamity strikes, you say, thank you, God. And then when something good happens, you still say, thank you, God. You know, so regardless of what's going on, just be grateful because the things that could cause so much stress in your life and strain in your life, could actually be the thing that helps you mm-hmm. and thing that's good. So um, those are two big pieces of advice. Yeah. No, I think that's very helpful, especially when you're going through obstacles, going through things, going through my own divorce and, and custody issues and stuff and being able to, sometimes it can cloud all everything up where I'm like, Oh, well, it sucks. Everything sucks. And then I have to walk around and be like, look how fuck your arcade machines. <laughs> 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 this is like beep, beep, beep. <laughs> free play. <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah. even gotta put a quarter in. You don't charge yourself. <laughs> it don't charge me nothing. This one does, but <laughs> <laughs> this one does. But I got, the, I got the yin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul, you have been a pleasure to talk with, and it was a pleasure to watch your special. I hope people check it out. Joy Player, get on YouTube. I recommend it. You guys know if I say that, I mean it. And if I don't, when someone comes on here, you also know what that means.
So I really appreciate you coming so I get to know you a little bit better. I wish you nothing but the best, man. You're you're really funny and really good dude. And um I already knew that because Blair always speaks so highly of you as well. So and I trust her opinion on so much. She's the best. Uh but it's really nice to get to know you and I hope um I just wish you the best, man. Likewise, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam! Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up. Hit it up. Press the button. Press it! <laughs>